Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of In the Prague Seat. Tonight, it's all about space rock. We're going to be talking about our five favorite space rock albums. But before we start, let's introduce the crew. We uh, start in top to bottom. We got Lewis Nasser. We got the professor of Prague, Ken Golden. We got Chad Hutchinson. We've got Eric Porter. And all the way from the Hudson Valley Squares, his first time ever on In the Prog Seat, Mr. Ryan Scow. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Ryan, coming at the last minute to uh, replace Anthony Ferrara, who had to bow out of this episode. Thank you, Ryan, for uh, doing one for the team here today and uh, putting together a quick little list. So, uh, yeah, this is all about space rock. So we really have not does, talked. Does Ryan own a yellow sweatshirt for us? Probably not. <laughs> Okay, just checking, you know. Anthony wears a yellow hoodie, hooded sweatshirt quite often on the show, so it's become kind of legendary. I have a yellow Hawkwind shirt, but I'd have to run upstairs and dig it out. And uh, That would uh, be very fitting, but we don't want you to go anywhere. Stay put. <laughs> it's, it's buried somewhere, but it's, it's a Warrior on the Edge of Time shirt I got in some closet. There you go. Very cool. So uh, we've talked about a lot of different space rock bands in various shows here on in the prog seat, but we've never done a specific space rock or favorite space rock album. So that's what we're doing today. So I've asked everybody to pick their top five um, space rock albums. And again, like we kind of we were talking amongst each other before we went on, space rock is kind of like a loose thing here, right? I mean, it's like there's lots of bands that people call space rock. Some people who are real aficionados about this uh, style of music, uh, you know, believe in certain bands and not others. So Ken, I don't know, you know, I'm going to ask you, what is your kind of definition of what space rock is? Well, for me, it's hard to differentiate between space rock, psychedelic rock, even stoner rock. I, I, I just kind of know it when I hear it. Um, I think for me, a key element is, is the keyboards, particularly a lot of synthesizers that gives it sort of that like, you know, cosmic sound. Uh, in, in my mind, psychedelic rock tends to have a little bit more focus on guitar, but even that's kind of a gray area. You know, one man's psychedelic rock is another man's space rock and yet another man's kraut rock. So like, you know, so I, I did a search for a definition. Rate Your Music had, a, I think, a pretty good uh, good definition, heavy use of synthesizers and guitar effects to create dense atmospheric soundscapes intended to evoke images of outer space and science fiction scenarios. I thought that's pretty good. I mean, you know, that part of, I think, the whole space rock thing is the theme. You know, there's this sort of thematic element. Um, one album, you know, I had this conversation with uh, Feigenbaum and... Uh, uh, Steve Feigenbaum, uh, about, I mentioned uh, Solaris, Martian Chronicles. Is that a space rock album? So, <clears throat> you know, I, at first I kind of thought it was. And Steve's take on it was thematically, yes. Musically, no. To him, it was symphonic rock. So, you know, it's got the flute. And, but to me, I hear a lot of that synthesizer going on. And uh, so... It's all kind of vague and, you know, I'll get it right and all you guys will get it wrong, but what the hell, we're, we'll still be friends. That's all that's important, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure drugs have something to do with this whole space rock thing, maybe just a little bit. Well, but, you know, yeah, certainly, but all of those things we talk about, psychedelic, you know, psychedelic rock or, you know, uh, sure, absolutely, kraut rock. Yep, yep. It's all kind of. But it, would it ball. would it be fair to say that it, it also has to have a a strong you know, with, within that context? It, it should also have a strong element of improvisation, right? Because a, a lot of these albums are not heavily composed. They're fucking jams that people yeah. did high yeah. as a Georgia pine. Yeah. So let's just be frank about that, because I think that that's that that's part of the thing, right? There are no choices and things that people do when they're they're high that they wouldn't necessarily do otherwise. These yeah, are things that have done I great favors to my record collection. I would agree to an extent, but there are some of the bands I think will be mentioned tonight do evoke a lot of melody. So there are 
there is a lot of rehearsed, you know, plan yeah. thing. But so, yeah, there's definitely a jam aspect, sure. So, so for sure, I mean, when you improvise, there may be themes that you keep coming back to, but then yeah. it's freeform, right? And and it's 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 not it's not pure chaos. That's not what right. I mean. But right. But it does have to have that spontaneous in the moment fucking freak out. And then and then then you're in space, right? That's what puts you in space, I think. I think there'll be plenty of freakouts tonight. Oh, yeah. Just so. just watch just watch Chad's cubicle. Um, cubicle. I, I I just want to say one other thing. For me, I, I'm I'm kind of boycotting my my number one and number two picks because they're kind of obvious, and I talk about them constantly. So I want to try and avoid them. I mean, if they come up, I'm happy to talk about them, but I'm not going to that. We are tired of that. Yeah. So yeah, you're tired of me anyway. So, you know. <laughs> all right. All that being said, uh, we're going to have Ryan kick us off tonight with his number five. Okay. Okay. Well, so uh, you gave this to me pretty recent. So I'm immediately, I'm thinking, man. So I pull all kinds of stuff out of my collection here. But one album immediately came to mind as probably like Merriam Webster uh, textbook definition of the sound because it meets everything that Ken just said uh, synthesizers, like, uh, outer space themes, prog rock, psychedelic rock, and that is uh, Planets by Eloy, their ninth album from uh, 1981. Uh, it's not my favorite. Uh, Silent Cries, Mighty Echoes, some of their 70s, a little more prog stuff is more to my liking. But uh, man, this album, I mean, I, it just it's almost like the textbook definition of it if you put Hawkwind aside. Well, I'm sure we'll get to in detail, but yeah, this album's real heavy on the synthesizers. You could definitely tell Frank, they definitely downplayed the guitars on this. It's very moody. You know, it's good headphones album. that just kind of drift away. There's no heavy, intense moments on it. Uh, not that they ever had that, but some of the earlier stuff had a bit of a little more bite to it, which they got rid of here. But uh, to good effect, uh, it's preceded by Colors, another very spacey album. But this one, because it actually has the outer space theme, I'm like, well, that's kind of almost the obvious choice. So... Yeah, my number five is Planets by Eloy. That's a great album. Yeah, it's a great album. Time to Turn was the sequel. And, uh, that's good also. also good. Yep. See, Pete, why didn't you have this guy on before? <laughs> yeah, Pete. He knows what he's talking about. He does. He does. <laughs> that's why he's such a, a, a mainstay on the Monday night show. You know, it's like I, I don't want to keep Brian busy every night of the week doing C Trek. That's true, too. Yeah. <laughs> Monday night, it's Cannibal Corpse. Tuesday night, it's Eloy. <laughs> well, diversity is the spice of life that's yeah. right that's right all right eric what do you got I, in fact i think eric came up with this topic if i remember correctly well <clears throat> we were talking before the show and i kind of came up with it only because i was going through pete i'm always trying to throw you something and i didn't see anything out there for it and this is one of the genres that uh yeah speaking of throwing right it's, it's just a genre that when i actually went through my collection there's a lot of bands that would I guess fall into this category because that was something we were going to discuss too that I only have a couple things from um, and I don't have entire collections of some of these bands that I'm sure are going to be mentioned tonight but for this I wanted to tip my hat to Chad um, one of the things that I miss and love about Nearfest was as they would announce bands I'd go out and buy something so I had everything from every band that was playing before I went to a Nearfest and this band really impressed me was Hydrea Spaceful, uh, Symbiosis, I think. And I think this is actually the one I bought for when I was going to see them at the show. Um, I really like this. I still listen to it. Um, it's got a lot of an exotic kind of quality to it in the, in the music and the way it's presented and played. Um, I enjoyed their performance a lot, but I never bought another CD by them. So this is the only thing that I have. Um, but I think they are a great band. I don't even know if they're still around. I meant to go out and check to see if they're still doing anything. Yeah, um, their last album was in 2012. 2012, yeah, okay. They, so I think they're Astronautica, done. Astronautica, which is quite good. Yeah. Um, I but I like, you know, I kind of like they put that, there's like an exotic, uh, at least on this disc, maybe more like that Indian kind of sound that they use um, in quite a few of the songs, a lot of synths, obviously. Um, but I thought they were great and I really enjoyed the CD, but never went any further with them. But I really, this is something that I would have pulled out as soon as I was uh, talking about Space Rock. So that's my number five. 
cool. Solid yeah, that was a good day. They put on a good performance. I remember that. Eric, Eric just stole my thunder. <clears throat> oh, really, Ken? <laughs> yeah, that was my. That was going to be my number right. five. Excellent. Ken's got a list of like 25. So. I was going to say, we're not taking anything from Ken, I'm sure. No, I, I, got, I got backups here, so. <clears throat> and for those of you who don't watch the Hudson Valley Squares, uh, Ryan's dogs regularly make an appearance, so, yep. uh, and they're very, very friendly and loving their daddy, so. I heard her crying at the door, so she had to come in. <laughs> All right, Chad, what do you got for your number five? Okay, this is a band that actually was mentioned by Ken a couple shows ago, a couple weeks ago. But it's a newer band or a newer album, and that's the Androgynous Amorphous with Peter Hamill. This is a really solid Pink Floydy space rock band with a lot of recurring themes. It has, you know, a nice effect on Peter Hamill's vocals coming in, in and out. Um, really highly recommended. This this is just it's a continuous. There's six tracks on here. They kind of flow into each other. Um, really hell of a uh, headphone album so um yeah that's i don't know anything else about them ken i don't know if you can give them any any background about their previous albums but i thought this was really really solid and, and they're the, really the nice is, oral uh treat it's two guys that they're they have a band called the future sounds in london it's basically a techno you know, techno electronic band and the guys are really interested in psychedelic music and this is sort of like their prog, space rock, psych thing, though. And uh, they're very, very influenced by Pink Floyd, early Pink Floyd. So, yeah, that was a good choice. Yeah, yeah really I good bought album. that too on your recommendation. It's terrific. Chad, you got hold that cover up again. It's got one of the greatest sure. album covers. Oh, of yeah, it's very cool. Look at that. And the music lives up to it. It's really good. Yeah, no, it's, it's actually really an Eloyish type cover, to be honest with you. A little yeah. bit, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's 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 pretty epic looking. Very cool. No, it looks like a peyote kind of night for me. The thing with that album, you know, there's it's heavily orchestrated, but it does have that kind of. I would call that a space rock album. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad I have your approval. Well, you do. For now, anyway. <laughs> For now, the only one pick so oh, far, Chad. Yeah, he's yeah. yeah, sitting four more to fuck up. <laughs> ah, thanks. All right, Ken, what do you got for number five? Now that well, all up. right. Well, Eric stole my thunder, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wing it with this one. With go with one of my alternates. So my number five is a band from Belgrade, Serbia, from Yugoslavia, and the band was called Igra Staklena Perli, which translates as the Glass Bee Game. What are you, Louis? What are you making fun of me? They were. I mean, you could uh, be talking about anything. That could be a fucking cha 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 record. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's all I'm saying. That's why. That's why I'm like. If, if I play this for you, be getting sexual favors from you, man, for sure. This album, th 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 these guys are great. Uh, very, very influenced by like Saucer Full of Secrets, Pink Floyd. Mm. Uh, a dose of a definite dose of Hawkwind, um, some you know, even some early Tangerine Dream. Uh, uh, it's a very short album; it's only twenty nine minutes. Because apparently there were two tracks that were recorded for the album that got lost, and that was it was Yugoslavia, nineteen seventy nine. I mean, you know, what do you what do you expect? So they they actually. They made uh, they made two studio albums, and this was the better of the two. Uh, second one, a little slightly different direction, and then uh, then uh, a label in Europe turned up all kinds of archival material that they released, including the live album. Very very good stuff. Uh, should be should be better known than they are, uh, for obvious reasons they're not, but they are a band of the highest caliber, and if one researches the band you'll you'll basically see people raving about this and considering it one of the great space rock albums of all time and it did is that, did it's, that ever make cd ken i don't know if it legitimately did i could tell you if you could wait two seconds i'll tell you um just to let everybody know we will have uh, all of our picks posted down in the comments below 
for everybody to go research uh, after the show. Chad, um, it only came out as a, uh, on CD as a bootleg. Okay, fair enough. So, um, yeah, it made LP and cassette. So, um, great, really spectacular band that should have been better known. Igris Stalin or Pearly, the Glass B game. Nice. And I, I apologize to any, anyone from Serbia as I, I, I destroy your language. I'm going to tell Mara, our merch lady, to watch this episode so she can tell me what exactly that record cover says. And, 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 and we can get to the bottom of this. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, the translation is a glass bead game. That, okay. that much I know. My pronunciation. Oh, yeah, yeah no, no. The, understood. I mean, and, I don't and, and the that. vinyl, that's quite rare. That's a, that's a rare one. All right. Lewis. All right. So in going with what we discussed earlier, that for me, what really makes space rock spacey is that it has to have some kind of um, live improvised moment, whether in the studio or on stage. My number five is also, and, and to commemorate that fantastic um, performance at Nearfest, I'm going to choose Idria Space Folk live 11 a.m. This record is unbelievable. And these dudes, by the way, um, I don't know, Chad, if you got to party with them or not. Holy shit, they're fun. So I had a blast with these guys and, and watching them play. And then afterwards, nothing but great memories. So once again, as always, thank you for putting those concerts together, you and Rob and everybody. It was our pleasure. And, uh, if people haven't heard this band, please give them a chance. Idria Space Folk. You, really hey, you, still, wrong. you still have copies of that? That one's out of print. That's too bad. Yeah. But I'll say about, I'll say a little bit more about that album uh, when it's my turn. <laughs> these are the, these are the, the gentlemen in question, right from that particular day. And holy shit, what a great day it was. That was Sunday morning? Yep. 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 The, 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 that woke really me the fuck up. Yeah, they had half the crowd were like half asleep and hung over from the night before. And uh, the other half were like in awe. I remember that some of my buddies were like half asleep and I'm watching and like, yeah, I'm missing this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Absolutely great. Yeah. Cool. All right. My number five could even be higher uh, on this list. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people that would pick this band fairly high up. Uh, the band is Gong. The album is You. Uh, to me, this is one of my favorite albums from them from the non-fusion era. So like there, to me, there's Gong, the, the old psychedelic space rock Gong, and then there's the fusion, jazz fusion Gong. This is my favorite of the earlier uh, era. And I think this would be like a five-star classic album if it didn't have those, like, like half the songs aren't like two minute little throwaway weird tracks. And then you've got, you know, Master Builder, which quite frankly is such a great song. Any album that's got Master Builder on, it's gotta be considered here. A Sprinkling of Clouds, The Isle of Everywhere, and The Never Blow Your Trip Forever, or You Never Blow Your Trip Forever. All four of those tracks are like, you know, six, nine minutes, 10 minutes, 11 minutes long. And they're amazing. I mean, just loads of epic synthesizer work, great Steve Hillage guitar solos. You've got screaming sax intricate drums and bass and just really really trippy vocals and this to me is classic space rock again i kind of wish they would have taken some of those throwaway tracks and put another long song on here because the rest of it is just absolutely killer you know to some people gong is a little too weird i get it, it took me a long time to get into this band especially like the like i said the earlier stuff but uh, yeah this is just a great great album really good production on it too gong you is my number five for today see for me that's not a space rock album. I know no. it's strange. I don't know. I thought about it long and hard about the, the Teapot Trilogy. And there's something, I think it's some of the things you talked about, which to me keep it kind of rooted in earth. It's got all the elements. It's got the hat. It's got the Hillage guitar. It's, you know, it's got the, the, the Tim Blake synthesizers. And it's got all the right elements. But for me, it just seems like kind of grounded in earth to some yeah. degree. I and know. I think a lot of it has to do with David Allen's vocals and that sort of weird element. I, I think it's fantastic. To me, it's a prog, psych, 
I, I can't embarrass, I don't know. To me, it's just not, it's just me. Like I said, we're all going to have different ideas. Great album. To me, they're so weird. I had to include them. I, that's just, I don't know. That's Well, I, yeah, I figured they would get mentioned. Yeah. All right, Ryan, what do you got? Number four. All right. So this is one of those albums where, uh, as you guys were saying, it's kind of a blurry line between space rock and psych rock. And uh, I love this album. Uh, I love their early stuff a lot. I'm not familiar with some of their later stuff, but uh, the band is, uh, it's an English band, Sundial. And this is their album, Other Way Out from 1990. Uh, it's, the themes are very psychedelic. They have songs like Planes of Nazca, Exploding in Your Mind, Magic Flight. It's very, very psychedelic. But to me, it kind of has that, I want to use the word ethereal, like the way it just kind of floats along. It's very mellow, very, very, no intensity to it. Very light, very airy. So that's where it kind of brings my mind to like space rock, even though it doesn't have those lyrical, uh, outer space lyrical themes too much. But uh, yeah, I was really on the fence with this one. And uh, I'll be honest, Pete, I had it narrowed down to, since I grabbed this stuff in a hurry, I had it narrowed down to this and magma. And I'm like, ah, I'm going to put the magma back because that's a, you know, that's a weird wormhole to go down with those guys. So I went with uh, Sundial from uh, England. So this is a 1990 album. I only actually have their first two albums. And after that, they put out, from what I saw, like at least a dozen, and I'm not familiar with most of it, but uh, and I'm looking at this, I'm like, ah, I really kind of got to dig back into these guys because this is really, really cool psych rock. I like this guy's a lot. So uh, this is a newer reissue from probably 10, 15 years ago, I'd say, maybe a little longer. But uh, yeah, great, great English psych space rock band. The first two are the best. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I've heard. So maybe that kind of stymied me from going further. But uh, the first two are awesome. So Gary, Gary Ramon. Right? Yep. Yeah, Gary Ramon, yes. Yeah. Cool. Is that a bangle shirt you're wearing? It is a bangle shirt. I love the bangle. Ah, look at that. <laughs> That's surprising. Oh, this, this guy knows what's up. Yeah. <laughs> I love the bangles, yeah. Very cool. Big All right, Eric, back to you. Okay, my number four, I'm going with Azure Tentacles. Yeah. I'm going with Earthland. And for me, I see them kind of as a space rock jam band. I, I love Ed Wynn's guitar playing. And to me, they just kind of, they have, they obviously rock too. I mean, I think that's one of the things with Osric Tentacles. I mean, I, they can get really heavy, um, but I do enjoy his guitar playing a lot. And I see them kind of in that jam band mode. I mean, when you see these jam bands out there playing, I can see them in a jam band lineup and fitting right in. Um, you know, and, and again, it's a little space here. I, and I do prefer... You know, the first, I, I don't care, like when you brought up Gong, Pete, I bought Gong um, you a long time ago. I always have trouble with the vocals with Gong, um, but I like the music with, so I tend to, with the space rock stuff, I tend to go for more stuff that's instrumental or mostly instrumental, um, which I think probably most of them are anyway, but um, I really like these guys. They've got a ton of stuff. And again, this is a band, I think I ended up buying three or four. And I felt like that was all I needed after that. So um, that's kind of where I stopped. But I do, I do love them, and this is my favorite of the ones I have. Yeah, that's a cool album. I would say the high for me, the highlight of that album is Sunscape with the acoustic. That's a very, very cool song. They're good, very good stuff. That one, that one was on my list originally. I swapped it out with a different one. Ken, I'm hitting the mark tonight with you. Are you killing me? Yeah, I like it. Me. <laughs> all right, Chad. All right, I'm going to do another little encore presentation. And Luis, you hit it on the mark for me. I picked the, the Hydria Space Folk live album that was recorded at Nearfest 2004. They pulled from their first two albums, and I think there's a couple uh, songs on here that were not on the first couple albums or the EP. Um, one of my favorite stories about these guys is they got in sort of overnight, and um, they arrived at Zellner Art Center without any equipment. So at 9 a.m., they were supposed to be starting their sound check, and they had no equipment. And we were watching the clock. We, they didn't, there was really no way for them to borrow stuff because everything was so specialized with their effects and all the, you know, the spacey stuff that they had going on. And um, at the last minute, I think maybe 9.30, quarter or 10, the truck shows up with all their stuff. Now, these guys have been up all night. They've been slowly freaking out about their equipment, this, their performance at, at our show. And they got sound checked 
they got on there at 11 a.m. Hence the name of the album, Live at 11 a.m. And just destroyed the place. They were so good. They brought a hell of a lot of energy. Uh, they had a lot of fun in there. You saw uh, Luis held it up, but I'll hold, hold it up again. And I think the most fitting picture from this is a guitar player. You can just see the smile on his face. I mean, that's between 11 and 12 a.m. after being up all night and had a freaking blast. They had so much fun. And also to Luis's point, uh, they were fun to have a couple beverages with. They were super fun guys. They um, just were consummate professionals with the whole thing. Uh, very appreciative. And they kicked so much ass. So my number four is the Idris Baseball Live album. I love that you, that you told the story because that, that helps me understand why they played so loose. After all the stress, yeah. and the other shit gets there, and now it's just fucking fun. That was, a, that was amazing. Yeah, yeah, they just great. ripped it, it out. Great. Yeah, they ripped it out and had so much fun up there. And then they just knew that when they were done an hour later, they could do whatever the hell they want. They could collapse. Who cares? They did it and they kill it. But I think, Lewis, that's just as amazing because it could have had them going sideways, too. I mean, when you're, you know... Yeah, but but they're pros, so they know not to fold like an origami vagina, and they just do what they have to do. So it's great. It's good. Is that a T-shirt saying now, Lewis? That was the. Oh, ultimate it could album. be. Pick, I guess it's up to Pete. That could be a band name. That's so good. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> Ken, what do you got? Uh, I have no prof for this one. I don't. I don't have a copy around here. Uh, my number four, Porcupine Tree, The Sky Moves Sideways. Oh, great. Wow. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. So for me, that that's still my favorite Porcupine Tree album. You know, um, it went, the, at that point, the band went from being a Stephen Wilson solo project to really becoming a band. He had Richard Barbieri come in from Japan, uh, the band Japan, not the country. And... Uh, Colin Edwards and Chris Maitland. So yeah, it was just had a the whole uh, the whole thing had a more mature sound than uh, up the down staircase and and uh, it it has an obvious Pink Floyd influence. I mean, I mean, really, Pink Floyd's the godhead of all of this stuff that we're talking about. I mean, early Pink Floyd. I mean, if it wasn't for that. It wouldn't be a genre probably right and uh it's in a way it's kind of it's kind of modeled after wish you were here you've got these two you've got the title piece that's split into two pieces and it's sandwiched around four shorter pieces vocal very vocal oriented and then this uh, 17 minute improvisation called moon loop uh, the music it's it seems more cosmic more expansive Little less, a little less introspective than before. Uh, maybe a little less. Certainly, it's certainly more serious. And I think it's very obvious the, that the influence that Richard Barbieri had, uh, what he brought to the table, and he just added a more depth of sound. Uh, I, I think it, I think it's a fantastic album. And when I when I pull out Porcupine Tree album, that's the one I that's the one I always gravitate towards. I know everybody's got their favorite, different periods. But for me, it was like the sound started to shift. You know, you had that and, and Coma Divine and Signify. And then it's sort of losing that spacey element. And he was moving into, you know, by the time of In Absentia, they had become a, a completely different band. And I lost a lot of, well, I, I lost interest to some degree. So, uh, but Sky Moves Sky Moves Sideways, that's my favorite. That's yeah, a great pick. You got me back, Ken. Thank you. <laughs> Payback's a bitch, huh? Yeah. It certainly is. Yeah. Lewis, what do you got? All right, this may be controversial for Mr. Golden here, but zero fucks given. Um, this is a band that is a nuclear blast. So normally um, you would think, okay, this is already disqualified, right? But for me, this particular album is everything that I like about space rock. It has enough pedals and filters and the guitars to be really trippy. And I'm talking about a band that maybe a lot of space rock fans don't listen to very often. 
They're called Earthless. And this is the album. This is Rhythms from a Cosmic Sky. This is kick-ass, take names kind of space rock. All right. And again, uh, for those of you, it only has three songs and it's not 20 minutes long. So you already know what you're getting. The, the, the opener has got five parts titled, uh, the, the whole thing is called Godspeed. And then it's part A, amplified, part B, passing, part C, trajectory, part D, perception, and part E, cascade. Somebody was high, but they made some great, great stuff. And I would highly recommend people check it out. You know, it's just a, it's a, it's just a beautiful, beautiful album. And um, it's heavy, which is something I enjoy, but it's also very trippy. So Earthless, check them out. Rhythms from a Cosmic Sky. I'm very happy you picked them. I thought about it because I've been listening to them like, like a ton lately. And all their albums are really great. Their new one is one of my favorite albums. Of oh, yeah. Too. Fantastic. Yeah, the new one. Uh, yeah, the new one but, really but, I did, but I didn't think of that one as Space Rock. This one, though, to me, it kind of does feel like that. You know, it has all the. So let me ask you guys, what what makes that album or Earthless space rock as opposed to Stoner Rock? I I would I I would say this, Stoner Rock is more sludgy. It tends to be very ponderous in its rhythms. There's a very heavy backbeat. This one tends to be a little bit more playful. There's a lot more texture sonically that they explore with the solos. So it, it, it really does take you on a kind of a cosmic journey versus I think a lot of the other ones, they're more into inner space, right? You're going inward. I, I haven't heard them in years, but you know, I liked what it's, I heard. But you, it, it, I, I, I love them. Um, like their, their new album has a, a certain Sabbath influence going on yeah. and a few of their albums do, whereas I think the early albums don't have as much of that. It's more these like, you know, interstellar psychedelic jam freak out type of things. Yes. So maybe that's where the difference is, right? Weren't they on TP originally? I think so. Yeah. I think they were on TP records, yeah. 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 yeah they're, oh, what a great band, man. That guitar player is so good. Ugh great it's yeah. great you know i've, I've told i've been telling people of late because i've been listening to the new album so much and people ask me well what does it sound like to me it sounds like Jimi hendrix jamming with sabbath's rhythm section yeah that's a great way of putting it it's just man it's just relentless I'd listen to that so good yeah it's, it's it's really good really good all right my next choice um I got to thank Ken for getting me into these guys. Uh, I've, it's one of these bands that I've heard about for a million years, but just never listened to. And I'm not even sure they even belong here today because uh, they kind of fit, but not. I think most people think of this band as like a kraut rock band, which again, kraut rock, some of it's kind of similar to what we're talking about today. Uh, the debut from Ashura Temple. Again, psychedelic. It's, you know, it's, it's spacey. It's, Lots of long jams, uh, guitar freakouts all over the place. There's loads of electronics bubbling around. It's weird. The rhythms are really kind of mesmerizing and odd. It's it's definitely not an easy listen. I'm sure there's some people that will hear this and be like, oh, my God, that's, uh, that's just really out there and just too much jamming. I love it. I think it's just amazing. Um, again, does it really fit? I don't know. But I think it kind of does because it just kind of takes you on a journey and it's it's definitely it's definitely out there, weird, wacky music, but man, is it gorgeous. So Ashra Temple, self-titled debut. That, that, that's one of my top 10, one of my all-time top 10. All top 10 albums, yeah. Yeah, it's great. Second album is great too. You know, after that, it's I, I actually I, I almost I almost listed join in tonight, which is I think the fourth album. That's when Klaus Schultz rejoined. And the thing with that album, to me, that's more of a kraut rock album. You know, these are terms we're throwing around that, you know, they start to become a little interchangeable to some degree. The thing with that album is two side long tracks. The first side is very guitar oriented. Manuel Gotching is kind of ripping away for like 18 minutes or nine minutes if you play it at 45 like I did. And, uh, and the second side is quieter more cosmic more expansive 
definitely side two, I'd say, is the space rock side. Yeah. You know? yeah. But side one is the one that makes you dick hard. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a really killer album for those who haven't heard it. It's, uh, yeah. All right, Ryan, back to you, number three. Oh, you're on mute there, Ryan. You're on mute, bud. Yeah, you're on mute. There we go. Sorry. I was, I was seeing if I was the uh, the problem with the sound. So, but uh, all right. So this one, uh, it's one of my all time favorite albums. Uh, but this comes from a weird place because this band, uh, they started in the '90s in Boston as a hardcore band, and their demos and their first album was pretty uh, by the book metallic hardcore, very good hardcore, but not at all related to the genre. And then, and uh, right around 2000, they did a massive left turn and they put out their second album. They jettisoned all the hardcore, except for every, like maybe 10 seconds worth of like harsher vocals. They jettisoned all the hardcore and they went balls deep into space rock and they did an awesome album. The band is called uh, Caven and the album is Jupiter. Uh, it's very compact songwriting. It, it's uh, very airy, very spacey. It does have kind of a heavy backbeat because they're a uh, hardcore and metal background kind of. You know, it's in their blood, so it kind of comes out a little bit, but uh, it's 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 pure space rock. The theme, you know, I mean, name of the album, and even the artwork there, Jupiter, uh, really really sells it. Uh, it's got a lot of very long, mellow parts to it, but uh, for the most part, the songs kind of stay in the three, four, five minute range, so they don't really go off into like lengthy jam sessions. But I, I love it. I, I think it's their their best album. Uh, they didn't stay like this. Their following album, they actually signed to RCA Records and did like a almost like a pop radio rock album, which I like too, but again, you know, totally, uh, they 180 their sound again, and they just kept going from there. Uh, but this this was a short moment in their history when they said, we know we're not gonna be a hardcore band anymore. We're gonna be a space rock band for a couple of years and they killed it. And I think I've known a lot of people that like this band and they're all, usually the consensus is that Jupiter is their, their finest album here. It's very, very cool. Uh, and it's, it's weird because you wouldn't expect like a hardcore band from Boston to just be like, you know what? We like Hawkwind a lot and Pink Floyd. So fuck it. We're going to go in that direction and kind of like, you know, forsake. And usually when bands do that, they get poo pooed. But uh, I remember when this came out, you know, people loved it. And I never heard any real negative word about it from the old fan base. So yep, my number three is Jupiter by Caven. Cool. I've never heard that. It's uh, you would like it. It's not despite the background, it's, not a metal or hardcore album at all it's it's straight up space rock and it's i mean the, the opening the title track that opens it jupiter uh you'll know like within 30 seconds if it's for you or not super catchy great soaring vocals so it definitely has that energy to it but it's you know it's a little hard to describe the way they kind of mash that together with space rock but they do it very well and it's a good album cool all right eric back to you Hey, my number three. I know I'm going to color outside the uh, lines a little bit on this one. So get ready, Ken. Because um, this is something myself. where <laughs> it's taking the rock out of space rock. But I can't think about this kind of music. It's more atmospheric. Ambient, I guess, is kind of where it sits. I've got a lot of this artist's ambient releases. And they put me in that mood. It's kind of like when I'm into wanting to hear something spacey or just to kind of sit back and mellow out, this guy does it for me. So I'm going with Brian Eno, Apollo. Um, I also like a lot of his ambient releases as well. It's not rock. You're not going to get drums and you're not going to get guitars, but the layers, the sound effects, the atmospheres that he creates, and obviously that cover for Apollo gives you that spaciness, but a lot of his stuff, I get lost in his music. And to me, that's what space rock would do. Um, it's something you get lost in. You're just sitting there, whether you're relaxing, hanging out, whatever. It just puts you in that. Nothing else is going on around you. And Brian Eno's music does that for me. So that is my number three. Hmm. Cool. Definitely a pretty influential guy. I thought you were going to say something completely different. Well, no, I... I thought, like, no, I, I thought, I thought you were going to talk about like Klaus Schultz or Tangerine Dream or something like that. That, that could tiptoe in at some point, but okay. <laughs> All right, Chad, back to you. All right, uh, my number three is a band that only put out two albums, uh, both early '90s, uh, from uh, from the UK. Their first album was okay. 
Uh, the second album, they brought in an, an, an additional guitar player, and it really, for me, knocks it out of the park. And the band is called Ship of Fools, and the album is called Out There Somewhere. Um, really nice themes, um, really great spacey guitar work, good bass grooves, a lot of um, sound samples from like NASA and, I don't know, random book quotes that I don't know, and um, even um, Wizard of Oz, there's some... Uh, I think there's actually a quote in there that is, I think the last transmission that went up to Challenger before it exploded, which is a little creepy, but I think that's in there. Uh, but really solid space rock album. The only vocals are those, are those samples. Um, but if you can find a copy of this, this fits the space rock uh, definition for me to a T. I listened to it again today. I've listened to it in a while. It's a fantastic record. It's really great. Um, so yeah, Ship of Fools from, from, from England. Check that one out. Yeah, that was on Delirium, wasn't it? Uh, Dreamtime. Dreamtime? Yeah, well, this one says Dreamtime. Okay. And the first uh, said it was Dreamtime was a subsidiary of metal label Peaceville. Oh. And the first okay. album was Close Your Eyes, Forget the World, 93. This one came out in 94. Yeah, they were good. Really good album. Peaceville, yeah, that's mostly uh, a lot of extreme metal stuff. Well, yeah, peace, it's part of Snapper. Case yeah, Snapper, yep, yep. Okay. Cool. All right, Ken, what do you got next? Well, I, I, I know all you guys are going to have this one, so I'm sorry if I'm ruining it for you. My, my number three is from Japan, and it's the second album from Fari's family band, Parallel World. Are you guys familiar with the Far East Family Band? I'm familiar, but I never heard it. I know the name. So they were uh, they were they were basically kind of nicknamed the Japanese Pink Floyd. They were led by uh, guitarist Fumio Maeshida. Uh, the album was produced by Klaus Schulz and mixed by Gunter Schickert, the uh, krautrock uh, musician. Uh, Schultz's influence is very obvious. I mean, his imprint is all over the album. And uh, the band, the interesting thing about Forest Family Band was that they had two keyboard players. One was uh, a guy named Akira Ito, who uh, went on to do New Age music and was quite successful. The other keyboard player was a guy by the name of Kataro. And that's where that's where Kataro got his start. And that's not Kataro's real name. I forget what his real name is. There's uh, there's an Asian flavor to the music, so it gets it starts out very tranquil and then just continually builds in intensity. You get that glissando guitar, the sitar, this tribal drumming, and then you get that floating Kataro synthesizer. There's Mellotron, you got the Hammond organ, the two keyboard players, they're kind of intertwining. And then it gets, it gets like a, a bit more up-tempo. There's this 30 minute title piece and you got Mayashida, he's, he's yelling out, free your mind. And you know, you do, you free your mind and it just kind of, then it just kind of mellows out and it just takes you out of the galaxy. Uh, it's, it's cosmic music and in some ways it's a forerunner of new age music uh, the, the band disintegrated after that i think my ishida might have moved to los angeles he he put together a new version of the band and it just it was okay but it didn't hit the the heights of parallel world and then kataro of course you know he went on to make a career and he was one of the founders of new age music and some of kataro's music i was going to include some of Kataro's music on my list, but since I was in the Far East Family Band, I figured I'd, I'd leave it off. But uh, he 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 made some pretty awful albums on his own, but he made some pretty serious albums. He, his first solo album, Tenkai Astral Trip, was fantastic, and I would easily call that space rock. And then uh, years later, there was a new label called Domo Records, and he made an album called Mandala, which was basically his tribute to Pink Floyd and, and prog rock. He grew, apparently he grew up on prog rock and it was, he, he made a very specific attempt to make a prog rock album. And he did, it's heavy. It's great. I saw him 
I saw him at the Academy of Music in Philly. It was the best sound I ever ever heard at a show at a concert. It was unbelievable. And uh, great guitar, violin. Anyway, I'm digressing. I'm babbling. But Fari's Family Band, Parallel World, amazing album. First album called The Cave Down to the Earth. Also fantastic. Remixed by Klaus Schultz, released in Germany under the name of Nippon Jin. More or less the same thing. It's, they took Far Out, which is a band I've talked about in the past. Um, my Ishida's, that was my Ishida's band. And then he put together Fari's Family Band. So uh, Nippon Jin was a reworking of some of the Far Out material melded with some of the material of Cave Down to the Earth, all remixed. So I guess some might call this their third album, but technically, really, it's their second album. Yeah, I gotta go. I gotta go check that out. That sounds pretty. You, this will, this will, this will blow you away. Mm, they were fantastic. Right. Those two albums are fantastic, and they were on CD. You can, you can, you can find them. They, you know, they, they, they got reissued in Japan on CD a few times. I think. Okay, I'll have to look for that. Excellent. Nice. All right, Lewis. Okay. <clears throat> So, like Pete, I originally was going to go with Gong Yu, which I really like. But um, truly, though, I think uh, I, I in this space rock thing, I mean, I love this. And it is weird, and it does put you out there. But for me, what makes this space rock mostly is the guitar player. Um, the keyboards are not quite as, 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 as trippy for me. So rather than go there, I decided instead to just go to the source and, and do this one. Fish Rising, Steve Hillage. Yeah. I just cut the shit. This is the real deal. And I love this record. So I'll do that one. That's not a Canterbury album? I don't know. I, I would say that um, it, it just doesn't seem to have enough, you know, puns in the song titles. It's not jazz. You're just gonna either. hear the, the teapot yeah. whistling in the background. I think I think it's I think there there are enough drugs going to overpower that that aspect in this one. So, but you could also argue it's it's psychedelic, right? And you would be right, of course. <clears throat> I, I know Anthony's off camera. Just handed that to him. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to include that as well, but then I'm like, ah, man, that means I got Hillage in here twice. And I'm like, I was like, all right. That's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, I, that, that to me is a big All right, my number three, uh, I'm also going to go with an Osric Tentacles album here, and I'm going to go Strangitude, which I think was their third album. Uh, yeah. yeah. Seeing these guys live, I mean, I, I had had uh, a handful of their albums, and I, I agree with Eric. It's like, they got a shit ton of albums. It really doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense to buy all of them because, you know, they're not all that different from each other. But if you get like maybe the classic five or six, you probably don't need any more, in my opinion. Um, yeah. But man, after seeing these guys live at Nearfest, they, they completely blew me away. And it was like, you felt like you were in deep, dark space with all these, you know, sequencers and synthesizers and guitar solos all over the place. The rhythms are in intoxicating i love edwin's uh, edwin's guitar playing i think he's a crazy crazy player uh white rhino t is my favorite track on here the title track is also great sploosh saucers this basically is uh all killer no filler i love the artwork yeah osric tentacles great great british band love them to death that's my number three <clears throat> back to ryan all right so uh I, this is an obvious one but uh i i felt like i'd be I felt weird if I made this list and didn't put this album on, so I'll just say it. It's a uh, Space Ritual by Hawkwind, uh, which I love. Great album. Uh, I know it doesn't have most of the stuff in their first two albums, which I do love, uh, except for Master of the Universe. Uh, it's all the, uh, I'm going to butcher this name because I always have the Remy Fessel, a Tito album, but uh, just the way they, they put this album together, just how it sounds, the way the songs flow into each other, the performance, the production, it's, it's fucking perfect, so... Uh, yeah, I'm going to Auckland. Uh, good old space ritual. And you know what? I, as soon as you said it, I pulled that album out and immediately started listening to it. I didn't have a lot of time to uh, listen to because you only told me recently, but I'm like, I got to put this on again. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a classic. I love it. So I don't know if it's my favorite thing Hawkwind ever did because they have such a wide variety of stuff. 
some of which I love, some of which I have no real use for. But uh, yeah, this one is space rituals always always welcome in the uh, rotation. So. It's like it's, it's like the good. comfort food in the Hawkwind buffet, right? It's like it really is. You know, you're gonna put it on. You know, you're gonna have a good time listening to it. It's, it's kind of uh, it's just right. It always does. It's just that exactly. It's a good comfort food space rock album. That is yep. a good description. Yep, <clears throat> good choice, Eric. Number two. My number two, and maybe you guys can help me with this because, again, this is a band I only have one album from, and I don't even remember where I heard the name or heard about this band, but it is God is an Astronaut, and the name of the album is All is Violent, All is Bright, and they're described as post-rock, which that doesn't mean anything to me. I, I don't know what that means, but very spacey keyboards another one kind of like Osric tentacles a lot of guitar up front but it's i guess it, i think it's rawer almost than Osric tentacles because Os Osric tentacles does have that jammy thing these guys are almost punk is the wrong word but they're 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 very heavy guitar wise um even with the keyboards and stuff going on in the background and it does get atmospheric there's some vocals that are more they're not singing. They're just kind of like humming over the top of the song. It's kind of a strange way to do the vocals. But I really like them. But again, never went any further than this. And I, I, we, I know we had that show a couple of weeks ago, but I don't know why. But um, just a real good edge to this band. So even though they are, they have their atmospheric and their spacey stuff, they're very heavy too. So if you're into that, and I think, this this could be a first for me as well. If when I looked it up, I think they're on or were on Napalm Records at one point. Mm. So check them out, see what you think. But definitely a very cool band. But if you can tell me what post rock means, um, I'm all ears. They were very they were very much an independent band, and then I think the last I think they finally signed with Napalm for the last album. Okay, they were I believe they're Irish. Yes, from Ireland. And I, I think I saw them at Baja, or another band that was also called God is an Astronaut. <laughs> I don't know, but but um, uh, yeah, and they were pretty trippy. But they had a lot of um, nar narrations, and they they came out dressed like like astronauts, and but with monk cows. So it was like this weird weird hybrid thing, and it was very hot. Mexicali is very hot. But they were doing the whole shtick, you know, so kudos to them. But I don't, I'm not sure if it's the same band because I don't, you know, but I do remember hearing that. God I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think and there's was heavy of those, Lewis, but, you know, yeah, was... they, <laughs> they were heavy. I mean, I, I only have the one record, but it's really heavy. But yet at the same time, it's definitely spacey. Not to digress, but post-rock to me is like one of the most frustrating musical terms I've ever heard in my life. Because yeah. like, you know, what, what the hell does that mean, post-rock? And a lot of those bands that they label post-rock, to me, are just like, kind of like rock bands that really like doom, but don't want to be a doom man, band and like space rock and like prog. And they kind of like do this wordless kind of meandering, kind of heavy, but not too heavy kind of music. I don't know. It's weird. I never understand it. I like some of it. Yeah, I, I, I do too. It's just, it's it's a point. Stands, right? Well, I mean, what the fuck does it mean? It's like postmodernism. The only word I understand with post is post itself or post it. It gets really weird after that. I don't, I don't really get it. I agree the with one, you. The ones that I like uh, are not like God is an astronaut. I like the stuff like Talk Talk and uh, Bark Psychosis. Are you familiar with those bands at all? Yeah. They're, they're very, di talk, I mean, yeah. Talk Talk is, Talk Talk, and Bark Psychosis, their their first album is considered to be the original post-rock album. And uh, the term was, some reviewer came up with that, that, that term. And Talk Talk is very similar. Uh, they're, they're very special albums and, and uh, Talk Talk started out as a pop band, you know, they had a big hit. And uh, the main guy, Mark Hollis, he took the band in, a, in with the third album. He took the, the album. Spirit of Eden, Ken? Is that the yeah, one? Spirit of, it, yeah, Spirit of Eden. Yeah, it's a 
That's really good. It's a masterpiece. Uh, I, I don't say that often. It's a very special record. He he takes the music in a completely different direction. It's very kind of plaintive. He has a very frail voice. There's just this incredible sen sense of space. It's very somber. It's very quiet. Yeah, it's perfect for CD. <laughs> and you have to really listen. There's all kinds of things going on in the background, a lot of textures. It, it's definitely one of those albums you want to listen to with the lights out. Bark Psychosis is very, very, very similar. There's all kinds of interesting things going on. There's Bark Psychosis is actually like a jazz element to their music. And you might even say that to some degree with Talk Talk. And you compare that to God as an Astronaut, it's it's not to me it's not even the same genre um you know uh, i'm looking at a list of of of, of post-rock bands there's one band that i saw called uh, from australia uh sleep makes waves and like they were a great band but like thinking of them versus something like talk talk it's, it's not it's not the same thing yeah when you say post-rock i think of bands like pelican um a giant squid explosions in the sky. But see, but that's to me, they call that post metal. Okay. Maybe post metal, post, post, metal, like post okay. jazz, yeah. post punk. Post, yeah, it's, I mean, it's silly. We're even more confused now than we were 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so, explosion, <laughs> like explosion, giants, another one. Explosions of the sky to me is more related to God as an astronaut. And Explosions of the Sky was the most frustrating band I ever heard of. They don't take a solo. I keep I just keep waiting for the guitar the guitar leads and they never come. Isn't that cliche though, Ken? Come on, can you move on a little bit? <laughs> no, I can't. I'm, I'm I'm rooted in the past, man. He wants I, his solos. You know, I want my release. You know, you're building up the tension. Give me the release. You're building to something, and they're building in the building, and it just never comes. No, I had a girlfriend like that, that. You know, in the sky girlfriend like that when I was 15, you know, it's like, I don't need that when I listen to music. Even the band name is a tease. Oh, boy. Yeah. All right, Chad, what do you got next? All right, my number two is a band from Belgium. Um, they've got a number of albums at this point. Looks like they have eight, eight uh, studio albums, a couple of live albums, and that is Quantum Fante. And this is their second album called Uga Suni, I think. Um, got this wacky looking insect on the front, but really very cool, liquidy uh, space rock, good guitar. But one of the highlights for this album for me is the flute. Uh, songs like Blocktail and especially the song Snowballs in Ghostland uh, has just, just a phenomenal melody with the flute. And it's, it's, it's an album in this genre that I come back to a lot. And um, I, would hi I highly recommend this one. I didn't dug too deep into their, their uh, discography. I have their second and third album. I have a live album. Um, I was talking to Rob last night about these guys. Um, and he really likes their fourth album, Bridges of Kukuriku. You know, I know I'm butchering these, but um, they all get good, very good ratings on Prague Archives. I think I might try out another one or two or three of these, um, but I've heard uh, their last two and they're very good. Yeah. Okay. And it looks like the last one got like really good ratings. Yeah. Um, they also did play near fest. Uh, they were a great band. Um, so uh, yeah, I would recommend quantum Fante. They're, they're very, very solid. Yep. Good choice. Forgot about them. Ken, what do you got next? Number two. Well, my number two, we talked about, so I'll just, I'll run through it quick. And for me, it was Strangitude, Ozark Technical Strangitude. Um, All right. Yeah. I mean, it was uh, the first four albums to me are almost interchangeable. And originally, I, I picked Earpland because it was the longest, it was the double. But really, Strangitude had, I think, had the best material. I'm, you know, you, you guys really nailed it. Um, you know, the, the, the core sound of the band, it's, it's Teapot Trilogy Gong. I mean, there's, but without the, without the stupidity, you know, without the silliness, um, you know, Ed Wynn, he does his best Steve Hillage. You got John Egan playing flute. Uh, the, there's uh, these guys groove like crazy and then they solo on top of it. And uh, 
sometimes they mix in like these Middle Eastern motifs. And also, you know, they had a they had a techno side project, and that kind of creeps in a little bit at times in terms of like the rhythms and stuff. But to me, they they were like the pure essence of space rock and lots of lots of copycats. All of them good, you know, all of them really good, all really good. But uh, I mean, you know, like even Hydria's space folk. I mean, they were like they call them the, the Finnish the Finnish Osric tentacles. So anyway, if we're making a list, the Osric has got to be on the list and uh, Stranger Two was on mine. Cool. Hey, could, oh, do we have time for me to tell my one, one quick Osric story? So I'll make it work. So that I, they play their first US show at the wetlands in, uh, down in Tribeca in Manhattan. Went to see those guys play. The nicest guys. I remember walking around the neighborhood with, with John the flute player <laughs> and they played they played about three hours if i recall with an intermit with an intermission and as and as i remember it and again i was probably a little wasted um at the break there was a delay for them coming out for the second set when they finally came out there was this big cloud of smoke which came out of the from the backstage area these guys were, were smoke, smoking a spliff that was like the size of a Monte Cristo. You know, it was like, it was, oh my God, these guys were, they were baked. And, but boy, it was one of the best shows I've ever seen in my life. They were. Well, amazing. let me piggyback on that for a second. When they played Nearfest, they were the headline headliner the Saturday, Saturday night, I believe. And they came off stage after their main set. And Ed and, um, oh, what's his... What's his wife's name? Um, Randy. Mandy. Brandy. They immediately Randy. come off and they light up a joint inside Zillner Art Center at, at, at stage left. And they're like, whoa, 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 you can't do that in here. And they said, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Stamped it out, went back on stage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's nothing. It's like, it's like, you know, it's like Luis. It's, you know, it's, it's nothing to him. <laughs> All right, yeah. Luis. All right, so my next choice, my number two. I have to 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 confess that I um I for many years I really hated this band. And in fact, when they did play Nearfest, I walked out straight up. And it took me a while, and actually it's thanks to Sea of Tranquility that I I I actually gave them a shot because I Every time I heard them, they just annoyed me. And when I saw them live, they just didn't cut it. So I was done, right? And I'm talking about Hawkwind, which is like, a, you know, sinful for fucking space rock. But I'm just, I'm just fessing up to all the people who watch. And, um, and I discovered and bought several of their albums, which I really like, as it turns out, right? And um, now the, the issue that I have with them, even to this day, for example, I was going to go with the Warriors at the end of time. But my problem is that that album is too long. It has great things, but I can't hang with it all the way through. I either listen to one part or the other, and that's all, all I got. So instead, I chose, you know, Hall of the Mountain Grill, which is a really, really good album. Um, I, I, of course, I came late to the party, so by the time I bought my disc, it came with a bunch of bonus tracks, which are some remixes of the originals and a couple of other ones. Um, I never ever listened to everything together. I, I just I just cut it off at uh, the last one, the Goat Willow. That's where it ends for me, and that's just the right length, and I'm happy with that. So this this is um this is actually a pretty good record, I have to say. Um, there there are many others. I, I think Warriors at the End of Time has got better stuff on it. But then it's got these lulls, man. For me, I just can't handle them. So I'm going to choose this one. Um, Space Ritual is beautiful, but, you know, this has been mentioned, so I'm going to go with this one instead. Awkward. Great choice. It's one of their better ones, I think. That whole that whole era is just so good. Yeah, it's the best era for me. Yeah, yeah. and you know, and the, the thing about Hawkwind is they're still releasing good albums to this day. There's just so many. But the 80s, there's a lot of good albums in the 80s, too, from them. Did you, did you ever think you'd see Eric Clapton playing on a Hawkwind album? No. That was weird. Yeah. Wasn't it? 
He's probably, he probably got that request and they're like, and who is this and how much am I getting paid? Okay, sure. Here's the track, you know? No, they, actually it turns out that him and Dave Brock have been buddies since the early sixties. <laughs> really? Oh, that's crazy. Wow. Yeah. They used to sit on the street corners together and something like that. Them. I don't know, but they, they were, they were good, good friends. And also don't forget, you had Ginger Baker in the band. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. So there was that connection. Wasn't that Levitation, that record? Levitation. Good album. Damn good album. Yeah. A, ver- yeah. a very un- a very underappreciated yeah. band. I agree with you. Yeah. You know, there, I there's, a band that, there's a band that almost didn't make it in the country for Near Fest. We found yeah. out about Those guys got 10 kind of, days ahead of time that they got approved. They get slammed all the time. They get a raft of shit. They made some damn great albums over the years. They did. They did. Absolutely. A lot of them. All right, my number two, uh, I, I had to include this. Again, most people probably call these guys just a prog band, but I find a lot of their music really spacey. And like Ken said earlier, you know, I think the blueprint for a lot of these bands is like early Pink Floyd. And to me, Eloy just did a great job on that kind of sound throughout the 70s. And Silent Cries and Mighty Echoes to me is a f- classic album. Fantastic. Call it prog, call it space rock. There you go. Oh, monster. It's, it's fucking it amazing. Yeah. I mean, just it's got all the elements right. Loads of killer synthesizer work, uh, searing guitar work. His vocal, you know, Frank's vocals are always a little odd anyway, but I think they're just kind of just weird enough that it just kind of fits here. You got all these big epic pieces. I mean, Astral Entrance, Master of Sensation, that's one of the greatest album openers of all time. The Apocalypse is great. Uh, Mighty Echoes, the whole thing is really good. Um, it's just a big, haunting, <clears throat> rocking piece of music. And uh, I've always loved it. It's always been my favorite from them. And it, it's it's space rock as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it's I'm funny, as, I, as much as I like Eloy, I like Pink Floyd, all that, I don't quite put them in the space rock category. Like they're spacey, but not space rock, if that makes sense to me. I don't know. You know, like Ken said earlier, we all have our definition. Yeah. yeah. To, that, to me, there are two, as it's kind of alluded to, alluded to at the beginning, there, for me, there are two albums, which are the Pink Elephant in the Room and Silent Cries is, and Mighty Echoes was one of them. You know, I, I didn't really want to bring it up because I always, you know, I always harp on what a great record it is. So I'm glad you did. Yeah. Cool. All right, back to Ryan for number ones. Here we go. All right, so this this one's out of left field, but uh, I, I beat this band up all the time on a Hudson Valley Squares. Uh, I got them fucking tattooed on my arm. Uh, yeah, so they can't see. Uh, so the band is uh, they they st- they probably had one of the biggest career arc changes I think in music. Uh, they started off as this post-apocalyptic Mad Max chainsaw gas mask thrash metal band. And then over the eighties, they totally changed over to basically just prog metal and basically a rock band. And they were great at every step of the way. Uh, and the band is uh, Voivod and the album is nothing face. So is this really space rock? Well, it's very really spacey in themes. Uh, I mean, I just, I talk about them nonstop, but people are fucking sick of it honestly uh but they do a, a cover of astronomy to mine by uh pink floyd on this and they do it really well and it was probably it was the only minor hit they ever had like it had some play on headbangers ball in the uh late 80s early 90s but it's a really good cover they make it heavy even though it's one of pink floyd's earlier like more spacey songs but they do it good they do it justice it doesn't sound weird doesn't sound forced uh Actually, I've seen them probably 12 times and they've played it almost every time. They usually close with it. So they definitely have that that respectful homage to like that era. Um, I'll say the drummer, uh, his name, nickname is Away. He gave an interview last year I read where he said two of the band's biggest influences. He listed like old English, like hardcore, like, you know, GBH, old English bands like Venom. But then he also talked uh, Pink Floyd's Animals and Van de Graaff Generator, HTE, as some of his biggest influences. So you can see the progression they took. So the 1989 album, Nothing Faced by Voivod, it's just, uh, it's just out of this world good. The guitar playing, I mean, uh, their guitarist, uh, Piggy, uh, sadly passed away years ago from cancer. My favorite guitarist of all time. Uh, the guy just sounds like nobody else in rock or metal, has this totally distinctive tone, soloing, his rhythm playing is just is beyond compare. So, yeah, I'm going with Voivod. And I, I saw it, I'm like, ah, this is, this is kind of... 
it's the spirit of the sound, but not really because it's a, it's a metal album. It's a prog metal album, but I'm like, mm. yeah, screw it. I love it. And it's very spacey in lyrics and themes. So it, it fits. So, you know what? I'll throw it in there. So my number one, and it's definitely one of my favorite albums of all time, is uh, Nothing Faced by Voivod. It is a great one. I will give you that. I love I'm it. so happy you mentioned Voivod, man. Fucking A. I love him. I talk, I talk about him to all everybody I know so much that they're like, uh, here we go again. You know, but uh, yeah, they're one of my favorite bands, and they they were just as good playing thrash metal and radio rock as they were playing prog metal too. And they they hit every nail on the head that they tried, and they're still going strong. You know, uh, forty years later, so absolutely raise a cool. Nice. All right, Eric, you're number one. My number one, I'm going obvious, and I won't apologize for it. And I'm sure this band has spacier albums, but this is actually the first thing that I can think of that I remember when I heard it in high school going, and I'd heard Dark Side of the Moon and Wish You Were Here, that really was floored me, like, what is going on here? And I'm going with metal, and obviously Echoes was the track that did it for me. Um, uh, and One of These Days is great. I love Gilmore and Richard Wright. The vocals together are absolutely amazing. And just having listened to that side two over and over, the great, song and vocal of echoes gilmore's great guitar playing and then it just kind of spaces out with their whale sounds or whatever they're doing just fantastic um and that's always stuck with me so that is my number one pink floyd uh metal yeah i i had metal in my number four originally and i replaced them with ashra temple and i, I my my reasoning was that um the bookend tracks on that album absolutely belong here. All the, all the songs in the middle are kind of yeah. like wishy-washy, like bring, kind of like, you know, bring, the bring back down to earth. Yeah, yeah. I was like, you know, but I, but at first I was like, well, but those two tracks are strong enough to, to keep it here. And then I started looking at all my ones in my album mentioned, and I'm like, man, I really want to get that Ashra album in here. So I was like, all right, Pink Floyd, you're out for those four tracks in the middle. But I was like, but it's, it's a great album. Those two songs are just immense and it's, it's hard to like not consider it right i mean it really is that's why that's what you said that's why i took them off my list it's, it's the songs in the middle they're fine but they are. It brings, yeah, yeah. but it brings your head down you know you start with one of these days and, and metal i mean what's better is a space rock piece of music than, than uh echoes nothing yeah. I mean, right <laughs> i mean echoes is the, is, is the bomb yeah. but it, yeah you know you'll never walk alone and all that other shit it's, yeah Sure. Just bring my it brings my head down, you know. All right, Chad, you're number one. All right, well, my number one, uh, uh, sort of an odd story arc. So back in the early '90s, I guess, um, I subscribed to a Rush fan mag called Show of Fans. And in the back, they always had little ads about who knows what. You know, some could be bands, some could be just just utter bullshit, whatever. So one day I see this little teeny ad back in the back and it, um, it mentions a band called Osric Tentacles. Now, Rush and Osric Tentacles don't really seem to have much of a linkage, but I was like, hmm, if Rush fans like this, maybe I should check it out. You know, I did what sheep do sometimes and I followed. Um, and at the time, their current album was Jurassic Shift. And this has stuck with me all these years, it remains my favorite. It's their first or their fourth album. It's the one that comes after Strangitude, which both Eric and Ken have held up earlier. Um, this by far is my favorite, even though I like Strangitude, I like Earthland, I like some of the ones that follow it. Uh, unlike, unlike you, Eric, I probably have 15 or 16 of their albums for no apparent reason whatsoever, <laughs> um, but I have them. Um, but yeah, I mean, Sun Hair, Jurassic Shift, um, Vita Voom probably has one of the best grooves and guitar licks on a space rock space rock song that there is and it's just it's just a smoking smoking example and an epitome of space rock for me so that's jurassic shift my number one yeah it's a great one. definitely one of the ones to to own i think we we named three of them here today right that are yep. like if you're going to start your uh collection with osric tentacles those are the three first ones to get without a doubt yep agreed cool all right, Ken, you're number one. You know, funny thing, I, I, the only one I have on vinyl was Punch and Effligent. I don't know why I, I never got the other ones on vinyl, but yeah, it, those first four, you know, they're kind of... Yeah, I thought they lost a step with Arborescence. I, I, 
I mean, that's oh. the fifth one. That, that one's okay. You come the other picks it up, and then you kind of well, they're repeating themselves the over and over. And by yeah. the time you get to the fifth yeah. one, you know. Yeah. So, Curious corn is pretty good. There's some good moments on there too. Might, yeah, I mean, some of them have some good stuff, like spirals and hyper hyperspace. Space. I remember being good. Wow, well, that's a weird effect. Uh, <laughs> uh, Marson's back. Is okay. <laughs> Floors too far away. I remember being pretty good. Uh, the live album Sunrise Festival, I thought was a pretty hot live album. So there's still good stuff in the catalog. But, um, you know, if Eric doesn't need it, Eric doesn't need it. <laughs> I mean, there's also, it has to be said, there, there, there's, there's such a thing as too much weed. There is? There is. And they are proof. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My, my number one, uh, mentioned by Ryan, right, it's... Hawkwind Space Ritual. And, you know, it, it's it's the sound of acid-tripping street punk punks launched into space. Uh, it It's probably, the, I, I think, the best version of the band. They had the two keyboard players, uh, Del Detmar from, I believe he was Canadian, and Dick Mick on synthesizers. These two guys playing synthesizers and electronics. You got Bob Calvert doing the, the narration. Uh melding all the songs together you had lemmy blasting away on bass you had dave brock on guitar it's this kind of tribal chaotic mess but somehow it just kind of it just it's just uniquely hawkwind you know it's like black sabbath jamming with pink floyd and then you got this light show going on and you got this naked housewife named station with big boobs she's dancing around on stage man that's if that doesn't take you into space, nothing will. And then, so, and then, don't forget about the, the crazy free free jazz man himself, Nick Turner, right? Who's just yeah, blown away. Blown, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And he was blown away. Yep. Yeah. yeah it, it's a great record. The the one album which we didn't talk about, which I didn't want to talk about, I'm going to talk about whether you like it or not, because this is the true number one, of course. Maybe it's my number one. Yeah, that's my. Number Is it your one. number one? That's my number one. <laughs> and I'm not going to talk about it. Good. I'll let you talk about it. Yeah, but, but you should you should hold it up because I don't have a copy. You gave you might... me the. You know, I I heard it thanks to you. So yeah, yeah, yeah. you should say talk about it. Grobschnit. Grobschnit solar music. Solar music. Holy shit! What a masterpiece. This is the album. That's that's the yeah. number one. The true number yes. one. But I'll let you talk about it. I've, I've held it up. You talk about it. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't here. even know how to begin to describe it. I mean, Ken was talking about Space Ritual as Pink Floyd jamming with Sabbath with a crazy freeform jazz um, element. This is this is somehow more disciplined, but in that discipline enters a greater wildness. There is a there's just this unbelievable energy in that record. And the thing about it, which is rare, for me at least, is that the more I hear it, the better it gets. And the better it gets, and the better it gets. I, I never tire of it. And, and, and it's one of those things where it really does put you in space, because if I put it on, I am in for the ride. It's not background music. I have to sit down in this room at three in the morning in the dark and hear it. And just hear it with headphones, and enjoy it it's it's a masterpiece of of emotion but also just weird trippiness it has that german thing has like a kraut rock sensibility but at the same time it's 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 powerful right it's really raunchy it's 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 a live recording i believe um it, it's just great it's it's um it, it, it's a great 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 record that I had I hadn't even I'd never heard anything by Grubshit before, so that's the one that popped my cherry, and I, I, no yeah. complaints. You know, it yeah. was fantastic. So very thank you, Ken, for that because that's one of the greatest gifts I've ever had musically. They, I, I, they, they played it different every night, and this this is what got ca ca uh, captured for German TV and got released as an album and uh man it's it the thing about it it just builds from just from the yes. opening notes it just continues to build you can't stop listening to this record you can't and, and the thing is if you listen to it on vinyl it's very frustrating 
because it cuts, chops right in the middle of the guitar solo. And he's playing this, he's playing this great guitar solo and just, and then you have to go over, you gotta flip the album. You know, they fix it on the CD, so it's continuous. But man, it just, it's an album. It just has got this trajectory yes. and it just, the release is just unbelievable. I mean, everybody gets the, everybody gets the solo. And I, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I think it's the masterpiece. You know, again, this to me is the ultimate space rock album. I'm glad you picked it. So I didn't have to say anything about it. There you go. <laughs> All right, so my number one, of course, has to be a Hawkman album, right? So which one do I, which way do I go, George? Which way do I go, right? So I, you know, Hawkman's one of those bands that like uh, my favorite album kind of fluctuates all the time. I have like this group of four or five that keep like kind of rotating. But I thought about it today and Lewis mentioned it before, Warrior on the Edge of Time. I really like this album a lot. Uh, I agree it is a little long but I don't mind that too much. Um, I, this is great stuff on here. Assault and Battery, The Golden Void is like one of the great Hawkwind album openers. Uh, the Wizard Blew His Horn is great. How about Opalaka? I mean, it's just so kind of like, it just grabs you, never lets you go. The Demented Man is great. great. Magnu, killer, killer song. Big eight minute long acid trip, you know, throbbing bass all over the place. This is uh, Lemmy's last album with the band which, uh, you know, Kings of Speed is good hard rock and Standing at the Edge is great. Spiral Galaxy is great. I don't know. I just love it. It's uh, it's a little bit more meditative and atmospheric in spots, I think, than some of the couple of the ones that came before it. But I just think it's just awesome. And uh, yeah, and with that artwork, just amazing. So, but, you know, I could have picked any album from this era. I have a question for you guys who have every copy of every record ever made in every version. Um, I is the Stephen Wilson remix really the the shit that one should get for that, or is the original okay? I haven't heard it, so I really can't say. This is the Cherry Red release from uh, 2015, and I have a bunch of theirs. They're really good, so I don't know. I don't know if the new one sounds much better. But this is great. That's the one I got. I think that one sounds really good. Yeah, it does sound really good. Yeah, it's it. really good. I have the Japanese vinyl pressing, which sounds okay to me. Uh, I'm going to be the lone dissenter, and I hope nobody from the label is listening. But I, sonically, yeah. I'm not a big fan of Esoteric's work or Cherry Red. Um, I think they do a magnificent job of packaging. You know, uh, Mark Powell's booklets and his research is second to none. But sonically, if you compare their remasters, versus earlier CD pressings, or vinyl pressings, I think consistently they fall short. So just take it from a guy who, who, who knows. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I sell a lot of their, a lot of their stuff. And like I said, beautifully packaged, beautifully researched, but if I listen, you know, sonically, there's always something that's a little, it's a little, uh, I don't know. But everybody's got to check for themselves, right? You know, so everybody's got their own set of ears. So, so. As I, yeah, as I say, you know, buy and buy, you know, buy a lot and buy often. Yes. So that's, my, that's my motto. <laughs> All right. Anybody want, before we go, anybody want to rattle off a couple of the honorables? Ryan, you got any? uh no because i kind of had to pull this out of my ass at the last minute so <laughs> okay if, if i get half an hour from now i'll probably think of like three or four more but uh actually you know what i didn't even think of it to mention until somebody mentioned it earlier a tangerine dream that totally escaped me and then someone dropped the name i'm like well of course you know but uh i don't have enough time to really because that's a big that's like hawkwind that's a big uh project to kind of source through all those albums and errors and music so i just let them be but yeah yeah yeah, some of the 70s albums, I think, definitely could uh, be in this conversation. I would say they, it definitely applies, yeah, but yeah. I just let them be because it, it was too much to go through in a short time. So I, I left that whole thing, is, you know, because then you, you're really going down the rabbit hole. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah it was, you know, once you start Wait, talking about Dream Dream, Klaus Schultz, you know, Adelbo Van Dyen and all those other 
guys. Yeah. And and then really is it is it rock? You know? Well, that's the thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. I, when Tangerine Dream introduced drumming, the albums kind of sucked, like you know, Cyclone and the albums weren't that good, you know. Klaus Schultz had a good one, you know, Moon Dawn. He had uh, I think that was the one he had Harold Groskopf playing drums. But again, it's not really rock music, you know, it's great stuff. But it's not oh, yeah. really rock music. Mm-hmm. Eric, you got any uh, leftovers and honorables? You're on mute. You're on mute. Um, Still on mute. I think everyone kind of touched on mine, kind of like what Ryan said. I had some Tangerine Dream, but figured that's probably for another show. I love some of Kit Walk and stuff, but you guys probably same thing. It's probably more uh, ambient atmospheric than actual rock, space rock. So I think it's pretty well covered tonight. Okay, cool. Chad, you got any? No, nothing extra. I mean, some of the stuff I thought about for honorable honorable mentions has been mentioned. So now, Ken, you got any left? No, I got a million. I'll run through them real quick. But here's one that was on everybody's list for space rock. I don't think of it as a space rock album. Nectar, Journey to the Center of the Eye. I had them as well. Yeah. You know, I don't know. To me, you know, they're a prog rock band, and you know that. I, I don't, but I don't that really first know. album does sound different than their other albums, right? It's- yeah, it does. It does. So, okay, here's some other stuff I have. I'll, I'll blow through them quick. Are you guys familiar with a Dutch band 35007? So, I can't see this. This one is called Phase Five. They, uh, I'm holding it up because I can't find my copy of Liquid, which was the album came before them. That is Smell the Glove by yeah. Spinal they, Tap Ken. The right. band was originally called Loose, L O O. S-E, and when you flipped it over, it appeared as 35007. It started out as a stoner rock band, and then they got very, very influenced by bands like the Osrics. Really good. Definitely 35007. Definitely worth exploring. There's another Dutch band which is outstanding in the space rock genre called Monomyth. Again, very similar. Those You can find those around. Uh, there's a band on Napalm, a German band called Monkey 3. They made a great album called Astro Symmetry, uh, Space Rock. Yugoslavian band from the 70s called Taco, T-A-K-O, not the, not the disco, Taco. Uh, and uh, they were kind of like a, you know, again, like a, sort of like a Yugoslavian Floyd. There's a superb Swedish space rock band called Yuri Gagarin named after the uh, the cosmonaut and they have a number of albums and they they I believe Yuri Gagarin are still active and uh, fantastic they you know lots lots of CDs available lots of vinyl and the last one that I would mention which is sort of on the cusp for me is uh, the great Dutch band group 1850 they had an album called Paradise Now which was kind of like an <clears throat> kind of like saucer full of secrets incarnate and uh it was from i think uh paradise now was 1970 or so they were really work they were basically contemporaries of pink floyd and i believe they played at festivals together uh, great band they made uh they made they made three great albums a game of trip uh to mother earth um uh, uh paradise now and then polyandry oh and then there was a live album also called on tour but all worth exploring that's what that's what I got. I'm sure there's more if I think about it, but it's my turn to shut up. Lewis, you got any left? The only thing I wanted to mention that I really love, and it is extraordinarily spacey, is is the soundtrack to Blade Runner. Oh, God, I yeah. love that album. Course, and that, right? that, by Evangelist, that, that is yeah. just Ooh, that is a good one. Get it unreal. I love that record, especially a headphone listen. I love that record. I, you know, it's it's a, uh, it's borderline, but it's it, for me, it falls on the right side of the line where I will really just take the trip, and and it is a soundtrack, so it's not meant to be a record that you listen to by itself. So it's, it's it basically is very much of its time and of the movie by this point, right? But I, I just love that record. To me, if you want to hear some of the the keyboard texture of space rock, that's where you go. Like if you're just going to show somebody the sound. Sound bite. There you go. Right. I would say. He plays drums on that also, doesn't he? I, I think so. I'm I not sure. I mean, I, I, I just love the record. I 
I, I've never really read it. I just put, throw it on and then listen. So I'm not sure who does what, but I um, I, I love it. It's and I've watched the movie so many times. One of my favorite movies. Yeah, we all have, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And uh, the 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 second part they made, the 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 music they composed for that was a a very respectful homage to the original. They oh, didn't uh, screw the pooch. The Blade music. 2049. Yeah. Yeah. The music. Yeah, the music the they did for that. It, that it worked. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I I just I'm a sucker for those keyboard sounds. And if you talk to Jacob Home Lupo from White Willow, he's an even bigger sucker for those sounds. So I, I, just, I bought the soundtrack for a Blade Runner 2049, but I never really looked who did it. I just I saw the movie. I'm like, this sounds great, and I just I bought it on CD, and uh, yeah, I've enjoyed it. But uh, I was kind of lazy about it. I never really looked who composed all this stuff. All right, all I got left that wasn't mentioned. Um... To me, they're kind of space rocky. Again, another band that might be considered more kraut rock, but uh, Agitation Free, the album Malesh, that's kind of kind of gives me the same type of feel as some of this other stuff. We're gonna, when we do our kraut rock show. Oh, they'll definitely come up. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's got, you know, that's more of a, that's rooted more in like the Middle East. You know, yeah, there's a lot of those. Yeah, yeah. There's, ethnic. It has like a you know real ethnic flavor to it. Yeah. Uh, Astra, the Black Chord, which kind of space rocky, I think. Um, that a band only did the two albums, and then lastly, uh, a fairly newish band to me, which you know not that far off the beaten path from what Earthless are doing, except probably more uh, sense and things used here is King Buffalo. Um, and I just I picked up a couple from Ken. I got the rest of their catalog. I bought it directly from them on Bandcamp. Really cool band. It's it's kind of um, it's kind of stoner rock. It's kind of psychedelic. It's kind of space rock. Kind of all rolled into one. Very very cool stuff, um, which I kind of did quite a bit. And then another band that I wanted to mention because I'm sure they're going to come up in the comments. How do you guys feel about Monster Magnet? Because a lot of people like tag them as a space rock band when i listen to them though i hear like a kind of stoner band but again yeah the line is pretty close it is it is a blurry line but but definitely stoner i think i don't power, think anybody would argue that power trip would be the one yeah yeah definitely a stoner band. very 90s kind of stoner rock too yeah yeah, yeah i would I, I would the closest to me would be power trip but it's got yeah. elements yeah there are um there are two bands i thought of while you guys were talking one is sts9 i don't know if you remember them yeah and uh, another one is quark space oh quarks oh yeah quark space absolutely yeah yeah I forgot all about it, there was i mean the the delirium label richard allen's delirium label he had he had a ton of these bands there were all these british festival you know all these festival bands like the Osrix and they, you know, and, uh, and people would show up and all these hippies would show up and everybody would, uh, they would dose and uh, go up on stage and play. There you go. Uh, they had, there was a great band called Cherokee Mist. I mean, they're all these, they're all these yeah. Uh, ST37, I think was, might've been one of the, I think they, I don't know if they were Italian, whatever. I think Black Widow did something with them. Yeah, there's, there's a ton of them. Yeah, a ton of them. I'm sure that, They'll, they'll let us know in the comments. Yeah, well, I'm sure there's something we forgot, and it's okay. So that, that's yeah. what everybody who's watching, that's that's your assignment now. So uh, list some of your favorite Space Rock albums down in the comments below. And uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, putting their list here together. And make sure you uh, tune in next Tuesday night for another rendition of In the Prog Seat. But till then, visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're here on YouTube all together all the damn time. For Eric Porter and our special guest today, Mr. Ryan Scow, who you'll see him again next uh, Monday night on the uh, Hudson Valley Squares, Ken Golden, Chad Hutchinson, and Lewis Nasser. I am Pete Pardo. Good night, everybody. See you tomorrow with uh, some new album reviews and, of course, uh, perfect album sides first thing in the morning. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay.